name is Jen Lemberger, and I'm a librarian here, and I get to work with the League of Women Voters on these monthly civic forums. A uh, couple of things before we start this afternoon. Uh, if you didn't already know, we do have a social justice book club. So that happens monthly on the third Tuesday of every month. So we just actually had our meeting yesterday. But the upcoming November book is She Said by Megan Tui and Jody Cantor. Um, it is their book about um, the work they did with Rowan Farrow and breaking um, the Harvey Weinstein um, affair and broadening the Me Too movement. So that is our read for November. There are flyers in the back for that. That. And then as well, we are officially in the midst of our Santa Barbara Reads programming, which is what we do every fall. We pick one book that we hope the entire community will read and join in discussions and events. So we hand out thousands of copies and invite everyone into the library um, to talk about it. Um, and it is actually a good bit related to our topic today. Um, it is Aristotle and Dante discover the secrets of the universe, and the two main characters are two teenage Mexican-American boys growing up in El Paso, Texas. Um, and it is sort of a quintessential coming-of-age story. It just so happens that the two teenage boys are the two that fall in love. Um, and that's pretty much just the great book um, by Benjamin O'Leary Science. So we encourage everyone to read it. It's really just well written and beautiful. It's a multi award winner. So um, if you come to our block party, which is tomorrow from 4 to 7 p.m., it's our big kickoff. We'll be closing Anapamu Street between State and Anacapa, having food trucks. So Fernando's Churros will be here, the corn guy with his elote, um, as well as Dawn Riders will be here, P Flag, uh, Pacific Pride, SB Tan, um, Parks and Rec will be running some games, and we'll also have tomorrow from 4 to 7. And we'll also have um, art activities and live music. Um, and then giving away 500 free copies of the book. Um, that's your best chance to get the book. We will have any remaining copies here at the Central Library as well as at the branches to pick up afterwards. But we cannot guarantee that they will be there. So if you want your free copy of the book, we encourage you to come tomorrow. And then one of the events that we are partnering with UCSB Gewirt School for um, SB Reads, we have our regular Fast and Curious program, um, but all of the talk, all of the speakers will be um, speaking on themes that relate to the book. So some of the topics are queer Latinx and politics of belonging, school mental health programs, overcoming adversity, community engaged research, Latinx youth empowerment, and mental health needs of ex-gang members. So that will be happening October 23rd at 7 p.m. So we encourage you all to come to that as well. So you can pick up Santa Barbara Reads programs in the back, find out all about everything that's going on from here until November 15th, including the author talk, which is November 4th, 7 p.m. at Marjorie Luke. So pick up your book tomorrow, join in the events, and come hear the author talk. Um, and today we will be talking about immigration in the US, um, the detention centers that exist, and the mental health and real effects that these have on our community members that live here. And with that, to introduce the afternoon, I would like to bring up President of the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara, Vijaya Jamalama Dhaka. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Jen Lemberger and the Santa Barbara Public Library for co-sponsoring this forum with us. The Santa Barbara Response Network is also a co-sponsor. Thank you, Jackie Yinder. Um, good afternoon. And um, this forum is about uh, kids, cages, and the immigration crisis in Santa Barbara. And we have four experts. I'm Vijaya Jamala Madaka. I am the president of our local league and our membership table at the entrance, Joan Vignocchi. Our uh, communications coordinator is subbing for uh, Susan Horn, our membership director. Um, and so please join us as a member. Please pick up uh, an envelope over there and support us. Um, thank you to Gary Atkins Sound Systems and uh, we, are uh, missing our simultaneous translator, Sylvia Uribe. She will probably um, make up for it later on, but we don't have um, a simultaneous translation today. Um, she, you know. 
Uh, and so um, thank you to our TV Santa Barbara crew, JP Montalvo, and um, he's in charge of this production, and we will also be live streaming to Facebook, um, so people at home can be watching this. Um, so um, our, our video tape uh, th uh, th that they're taping right now will be available on our website, which you see the uh, homepage over here. And you just scroll down, and we have a YouTube link that you click on, and you get all the videos. Um, we will have two follow-up discussion groups to continue the conversation of this topic. Uh, one on October 25th, it'll be at Dargan's. It's a lunchtime group, 11.30. Um, and then we have a supper group uh, at November, on November 4th, and RSVPs are required. You can go online and RSVP to us. Um, and our next month's program is really interesting. Uh, it'll be on November 20th, and it's at our regular time, noon to 2 p.m. And the theme is Countdown to 100, Women Leaders Talk Across Generations. And the women leaders, actually, are some exciting people. Um, they will be um, talking about, they will be conversing about what we look forward to when we uh, toward, we're looking towards 2020, um, our uh, uh, 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, which is uh, coming up, and uh, where we have been and where we will be going. So it'll be really interesting. The, the leaders are Joy Pikus, Susan Ho uh, Rose, um, Janet Wolf, Gloria Soto, Luce Reis Martin, and Kristen Snedden, so that'll be a good one. Please read our email updates, check our website calendar for all of our updates, uh, our upcoming events. And lastly, thank you to um, Jackie Inda and our league board members, Pam Flint Tambo and Susan Horn, uh, the committee that put this together, Susan Horn, chaired this forum organizing committee and will be our moderator today. Susan has her degrees in education, and she recently retired from 30 years of working in public health. Uh, at the League of Women Voters, she worked as director of water service uh, uh, in the past two years, and then uh, award-winning, I must say. We, she won awards at our uh, League convention uh, for her water service uh, uh, services, and became chair of membership uh, this past July. Susan also works on social policy committee in the League and on local organizations such as CLUE and National Association for Mental Illness. Please welcome our moderator, Susan Horn. About the forum topic, uh, that title is um, difficult to even read for me, Kids, Cages, and the Immigration Crisis in Santa Barbara. Um, it's tough to talk about it because w one thing is that changes are happening so fast in immigration rules, and another thing is that there's so much distress around the, what's happening. So we want to understand what's happening, why, how does it impact families in Santa Barbara County, and what can we do to help make the immigration system be more humane? To be humane, not more, just solid. Um, so I looked up the positions in the book that the League has on their, all their positions. They're like 100. There are lots on environment, housing, all these different things. And um, I found it. I found immigration. I read it. And what did I find? Please see for yourself, I have, I made a copy of, out of the book of the um, two-sided sheet here on the immigration um, p positions of the league. And what I saw is that there is a path to humane immigration policies. So the trigger for doing this distressing topic as a community forum was TV news. The photos and videos about separation of families and the detention of children at the Mexico-US border with the children kept in cages in very poor prison-like conditions and no way for them to find out what is happening, why, how long, 
and when or if they will ever see their parents or their siblings again. Actually, this news and these images triggered renewed trauma for one of us in the league who experienced such separations as a child. And she's the one that led us to do this forum, seeing the lifelong effects. Um, so Santa Barbara may be hundreds of miles from the US-Mexico border, but the immigration crisis is impacting our children, our families here. And um, just the other uh, day or, or the week, I heard this from a friend, so it's not got all the details correct possibly, but one day after school on the east side, um, the children were waiting for their parents to be picked up and their parents were not showing up. And soon the children became distressed and anxious at this unusual occurrence. And it was learned that ICE, ICE, had been seen in the neighborhood that day. And the parents were afraid to leave their homes. Uh, the teachers and staff finally took the children to their homes. Uh, and I just can imagine the stress that caused for everybody. Um, by the way, ICE stands for Immigration and Customs enforcement, and that is a part of the Department of Homeland Security. I had to look that up. So um, we have a great set of four outstanding speakers who grapple with these issues every day. And to help us understand the, the issues today, uh, we have Blanca from Rep Representative Carbajal's office, Javier from the Mexican Consul's office, Alejandra or Ali, who is a youth outreach specialist at the local schools, and Jacqueline, who's a family and community advocate on human rights for immigrants. Let me introduce our first panelist, Blanca Figueroa. She's our district representative for Salud Carbajal's at the Congressman's office. And she's been part of the House of Representatives for eight years. As district representative, she works with Representative Carbajal on immigration and Latino issues in particular in the Santa Maria and Santa Barbara offices. And in that capacity, she interacts with immigration agencies, several. And prior to joining Representative Carbajal's office, she was part of the team of Representative Lois Capps as her representative, so, um, and also immigration and Latino community outreach coordinator. So her experience and training is deep and wide. So uh, she also has personal experiences and understands the difficulties of immigration process as she and her family immigrated from Mexico to the United States 25 years ago. And a, a little added note is that before she um, entered government work, she has a personal, uh, she had her education at UCLA in journalism, TV, broadcast in Spanish language. And her career was in Spanish, radio, and TV as news director, anchor, reporter, and producer. So she's got a great background. And we're so glad to have you representing us and here at the podium. Thank you, Susan. And thank you to the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara for inviting us to this photo. So before, um, before I start my presentation, thank you so much for this invitation. It's a pleasure. Um, I want to start with this, um, with this graphic, because Congressman Carbajal last week, he attended um, one of the schools in San Luis Obispo, and their teachers um, asked them to write about, if they have the power to write a bill and that becomes a law, what would it be? So this is a third grade, th third grade um, child who said, a girl, who said, if I wrote a bill, it would be that I think that children shouldn't be separated from their parents because imagine if you didn't see your parents every day no dad to cook your food, no mom to wake you up and to put you to sleep. I think, how, how will you make you feel happy, sad, embarrassed, quiet, or excited? Please think this through 
and consider a bill. So this is what an eight-year-old girl wrote in Santa Maria, in, in San Luis Obispo, and handed to Congressman Carvajal. And thank, thankfully, there's, there are some bills that are related to, to these, and that's why I wanted to show up this, this graphic. But before, uh, before I go into the bills and proposals from DC, um, I want to talk about a little bit about why immigration is, is a big deal and why it's increasing every year. Um, according to Congressional Research um, Service, the major factors contributing to um, an unaccompanied uh, alien child come to the United States is because of violence, um, violent crimes, economic conditions, extreme poverty, uh, pres presence of uh, transnational gangs, and other factors um, attracting them to come to the United States, such as um, economic opportunity and the desire to reunite with their families and intensive, and intensive possessed by the U.S. Um, immigration policies. And they mainly be, um, emigrated from Mexico, so from northern central Mexico, um, from Africa as well, from the Middle East, from um, South America, and um, also parts of Asia. And according to um, US Department of Health and Human Services, this is what, um, what they have told us in meetings with congressional staff in DC. They have told us that this is how they process, how they process their, their, their children when they cross the border. Um, Office of Refugee Resettlement, that is under the umbrella of Department of Homeland Security and uh, Department of Health and Human Services, has over 100 shelters and facilities, as well as long-term foster care locations across um, the US where children stayed. Every child is input into an online portal run by Office of Refugee, uh, Refugee Resettlement. And by the way, Congressman Carvajal toured two places, two um, uh, facilities, one in Texas, in Tornillo, Texas in 2018, and the other one in Gordon, New Mexico in 2019. Um, and the one in Texas already closed at the beginning of this year, in January 2019, and in, Mexi in New Mexico, uh, it was reported one, one child passed away there. So what happens when a child is apprehended at the border? Um, when uh, unaccompanied alien children are identified, they enter the portal, uh, it helps them to determine where they will be placed, and they go through a health screening. It runs within 24 hours of apprehension, and full intensive medical exam conducted within 48 hours of apprehensions, including such as immunizations, tuberculosis screening, age and risk-based screening, et cetera. A medical report is uploaded into the portal and any um, abnormal is flagged and reviewed and if necessary, they're referred to the correct um, physician. So what happens when, when a child uh, has a special health needs? Uh, the Office of Refugee Resettlement attempts to find the best place to put the child where they can have the correct medical attention. This is according to um, several meetings that we have had in the past uh, recently as well with the Office of U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and Congressional Liaisons. Uh, one, here are the numbers when um, uh, UAC, UAC apprehensions between the port of entry here in California by, count, uh, by country. So the main um, immigration from uh, Honduras is almost 75,000 per year. So from last October, from last uh, August until today, almost 75,000. Second one is El Salvador, third Guatemala, uh, fourth Mexico, and the yellow one is others. Um, they asked me to talk about a specific story, and this one is, it was all over the news. There are two big stories, but this one, um, Congressman was very touched, and we, we, we have talked about this before. Um, this lady, Jasmine Juarez, um, her little daughter, 19, years, 19 months old, uh, passed away on a facility um, during Mother's Day. And she, was, she, was, um, she got ill in the facility and then she was transferred to a hospital where, where she passed away. And mainly she was um, 
misdiagnosed. Um, at the end, she had a pulmonary infection, and that's what, what um, ended to her passing away. And we believe there are three total deaths in facilities, but there are many more, many more at the border and at, at other facilities. And mainly here in California, around the country, nationwide is in 216 counties, the total number of uh, unaccompanied alien ch uh, children released to sponsors since October of last year up to August of this year. Uh, in California, there has been 8,002 um, children that have been released to sponsors. And if you can see in blue, are the main ones are in close to us in Los Angeles, 3,350, 3, Santa Barbara, 89, and Ventura County, 131 that have been released to um, families or sponsors. What kind of access, I was asked to, um, that this question um, needed to be here, so that's why we, we put it there. What kind of access does the media have to health and human services facilities? And according to the Department of Health and Human Services, more than 50 um, separate media outlets have toured the um, Department of Health and Human Services um, founded here in the US, and there are restrictions of what kind of media coverage is possible due to the need of privacy regarding children in their, in their care. The US Department of Health and Human Services is committed to transparency around their work and children, and has also made available photos and videos of facilities housing boys and girls taken recently uh, and dating back to 2016, demonstrating continuing of care across the administration. I have some handouts that I brought in um, about um, their facts on this website, on the Department of Health and Human Services, and you can find them in the, by the entrance. Um, and there's the website as well. If you, make sure you go to .gov, because if you go to .com, it's a completely different thing. So now I want to talk a little bit about the bills that are related to immigration and mainly to the border and to, um, to children. These six that you have seen, that you see on the, on the screen, are the ones that congressmen supported, and they already passed in the House of Representatives. But there, there's still no action in the Senate, unfortunately. But the one that is um, highlighted on yellow is the one that it's already implemented. It's a law. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit about that. But these, the three first ones are very important um, because they do provide reliefs to children and to the general public, not just detainees, but um, every person who crosses the border. And um, where do I have the... If you go to congress.gov, you can track these bills and see where they're at and what it needs to be done in order to pass in the Senate. If you are wondering, what do I do in order for these bills to pass in the Senate? Well, contact your senator, call them and tell them, can you please ask Senator Kamala Harris or Feinstein to pass these bills. These, the first three are related to the, um, to the DREAMers, the second one to humanitarian, humanitarian standards for uh, individuals in Customs and Border Protection uh, Custody Act, and the third one, Homeland Security Improvement Act, the fourth one, also important, U.S. Border um, Patrol Medical Screening Standards Act, and the other one, Families, um, Families for High Skill Immigration Act. But the first ones that I mentioned, um, I can go in deep a little bit about them um, and the reason why it's important for them to support them. If I can find my cheat here. <laughs> but let me go first on the emergency supplemental bill for, um, to provide humanitarian assistance at the border that already became a law uh, on July and passed in the Senate. And this one, the Emergency Supplemental Bill provides uh, four, $4.6 billion in supplemental funding to address the humanitarian crisis at the southern border, including $2.9 billion for the Health and Human Services Office of Refugees Resettlement, which is 
very important to have those, that money there. And 112 million for food, baby formula, clothing, air conditioning, medical care, medical vehicles, showers, units, hand wash, stations, food storage, hygiene products for both adults and young ch children. Um, mandates also monthly reporting of family separations uh, incidents, allowing congressional visitations um, of Office of Refugee Resettlement families within 48 hours noticed and increased the funding for the HHS Office of the Inspector General. Doubles the amount of resources dedicated to legal orientation for migrants and explains hiring of immigration judge teams to reduce the backlog of over 80, 850,000 immigration cases, which is a lot. It also, um, the Speaker of the House secured these insurances from the administrations, a one notification to Congress within 24 hours of a child dying in custody, we need to be um, notified when a, a child dies, and a 90 day limit on the length of time a child can be held in an influx facility. So those are very important that um, the Speaker of the House wanted to have it there. Um, fully reject the President's request for more ICE detentions beds and prohibits funds from being uh, redirected for a, for a border wall or increased enforcement. So these are, um, this is the, the, the bill that already became a law. And the other bills that I wanna talk about, it, they're, they're in the process of, they're sitting in, this, in the house, they're not even passed yet. That's also why you need to contact your congressional member of Congress to um, ask for these bills to uh, move forward. Can congressmen have support of them? They're also related to immigration and separation of families, keep families together. Um, again, if you go to uh, congress.gov, search HR 6135, then you can track it down and see who is not sponsoring this bill so you can call them, call your Congress, member of Congress and say, can you please support this bill? So that way the, the House can work on, on them. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight other bills related to immigration that are um, highly important, including the DREAMers, um, the Agriculture Worker Program Act, the, um, the Accountable for Immigrant Debts Act, so you can search them on congress.gov and track them and call your representative. But by the way, Congressman is co-sponsoring all these bills. And there are other hundreds of bills that it's impossible to put them all down. <laughs> but the, here are the federal resources if you wanna find out more information about um, the, the, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Homeland Security, how it works, um, all these um, websites that I'm related to are working with uh, Department of Homeland Security or it's under the umbrella of Department of Homeland Security and is basically the one um, that are also are part of the um, border situation, border crisis. Um, immigration and Customs Enforcement, uh, Susan mentioned it, is, is, is the, the federal agency who apprehends them once they're here. CBP, Customs and Border uh, Protection, is the ones that um, take care of them at the border and U.S. Citizen Immigration Services is the one who provides the immigration benefits. Uh, asylum cases go there too, as well. So, people are uh, wondering if the new rule, um, the new rule that is implemented for public charge is gonna affect citizens, citizenship applications. And the good thing is that it's not. It's not the, if you wanna become a U.S. citizen and you're receiving benefits, it's not gonna affect you. So. There's a current backlog of three months at the regional office. Um, once you apply for citizenship, in the past it was from six to nine months, the waiting period to become a U.S. citizen, and now it's, it's a little bit longer. Um, if, if you think you have several DUIs or some criminal background, even from 10 years ago, before applying, it's better to do your fingerprints, fingerprints with the FBI. You can do them um, uh, at the police department or go to the Department of Justice and look for um, people who, are, who can do this. That way you are secure or you're sure that this is not gonna affect you. 
the application for the N400 is, um, it's $725 and $85 out of those goes to biometrics. And if you are 75 um, age and older, you do not have to pay biometrics. And there's two waivers. If you, um, if you are low income, you can uh, fee the waive completely or reduce the fee. And those, those are the two applications that you need to apply if you're considering, if you don't have enough money to apply for citizenship, you can ask for reduce uh, fee or, um, or, not, or not to pay anything. And they also accept credit cards, which is kind of new implementation in the last three, two years. So public charge does not apply for any naturalization process, as I, as I just said. And as of October 11th, um, three judges, separate cases in the U.S. court districts in New York, uh, Northern California, and Washington, D.C., joined the Department of Homeland Security from implementing and enforcing the final rule related to the public, to public charge ground and admissibility under Section 212 of the Immigration and Nationality Act postpone it an effective date for the final rule until there is a final resolution in the cases. So there, the two of the injunctions are nation, nationwide, uh, nationwide and prevent USCIS from implementing the rule anywhere in the United States. The administration's rule will be used to deny only green cards to legal immigrants receiving assistance from certain government uh, programs such as um, SNAP, uh, TNF, Medical, Medicaid Part B, and Section 8 housing. If you want more information for on public charge, go to USCIS.gov. It's on the previous page. And just uh, put public charge, USCIS.gov, that very last one. People are wondering, or the million question, if, what about if, um, if my green can expire? Do I still qualify for citizenship? What do you think? Yes or no? Yes. Even if your green card is expired, you can still apply for citizenship. You don't have to pay the $460 to renew your green card. You can just become a, uh, apply for citizenship even if your green card has been expired for the last three, three years. Uh, but what about if I own child support? Can I still apply for citizenship? What do you think? Probably not. Probably yes. But you have to have a payment plan. And you have to prove, and you have to show them, and you have to send the, the proof. So if you own less than $2,000, um, less than $2,000, you are allowed to uh, obtain a US passport. If you own more than 2,000, you're not allowed, okay? And if you owe to the IRS, same thing, as long as you have a payment plan. But if you own more than 10,000, you, can you cannot get a passport or obtain a US passport. If you have a DUI within the last five years, yes, but my, some restrictions might apply. So that's why I encourage you to do your fingerprints before you apply, and it's really easy. And the website for the USCIS that gov is free. If you go to .com, they're going to charge you for the, the forms. The forms are free. There are a lot of resources to study the test. I also brought some brochures in the front table. And there's an app, an app on your iPhone that you can study for the test. And as I said, I have a whole presentation just for citizenship. I'm happy to do another one for separately. separately. Um, once you do, the last step is the oath ceremony in, in the convention center. Once you receive your certificate of naturalization, you can obtain a, a US congressional recognition during July in Santa Barbara and Santa Maria. Congressman is um, organizing ceremonies for people who become US citizens. So I encourage you to if you want more information, um, I have brochures in the, in the front, and we have three offices, and our website, carvajal.house.gov. My name is Blanca Figueroa. I have some cards. If you have any more questions, um, let me know. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a lot of information, and just so... So helpful to our understanding. Um, next we have Javier Cerritos, did I say that right? <laughs> um, who is, works at the consul, the Mexican consulate in Oxnard. 
Some of us don't even know that exists here, but they are around the United States. And um, Javier got his bachelor's degree in international relations from the university in Mexico. And his interest in the Mexican Foreign Service began when he was doing an internship during his college years. And he was assigned a, a, his internship at the Consulate of Mexico in Calexico, California. Then once he graduated, he started to work at the um, municipality of San Miguel de Allende. And there he, he managed programs and also assisted migrants and their families. And then he, he joined the Mexican Foreign Service in 2015. And his first assignment was in Oxnard, the Mex Mexican consulate. And now he's serving as the head of protection department there. During his time in the Mexican consulate there, he's uh, reinforced the bonds of the consulate with local authorities, helping to strengthen the ties of friendship and cooperation with Mexico and the Mexican community that live in the Tri-Counties. Is that, is Tri-Counties? Yes. San Luis, Santa Barbara, and Ventura? Okay, thanks. He is currently also studying, again, for another degree in international migration. So we want to welcome you. Thank you so much for coming all the way. Thank you, Susan. Yes, as Susan said, um, the Mexican consulate, we're in charge of the three counties, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, and Ventura. So it's quite a bit of area. There's approximately half a million Mexicans living in this area. And then the consulate, we're only like 26 people in total. So we have quite a bit of work um, every day, <laughs> every day. <laughs> So, but, it, but it's an adventure. It's something we, we appreciate uh, having forums like these where we can inform people uh, about what we do, and most of all, that we exist. That's one uh, of the issues I'm trying to, to, to confront since I arrived in 2015, is to inform people that we exist, that there's a Mexican consulate in Oxnard, because sometimes people want to receive a consular service and they just think, oh, I have to go to all the way to LA when they have an office nearby. And, um, and if they know that we exist, it is important that they know what we do. Because I've had uh, Mexican nationals tell me, uh, you know, I can't go to the Mexican consulate because I don't have papers, I'm, I'm undocumented. I'm like, wow. Well, if you're in that vulnerable situation, on the contrary, please come to the consulate. Let us help you. Let, let us assist you. And for example, my title is the Council for Protection and Legal Affairs. Sometimes people think protection means like a police or bodyguard type of issue. It's nothing like that. It's more paperwork, really. It's uh, more focused on social services. So what we do is promote, like in this case, the services that the consulate does, assist in cases of emergencies, in cases uh, someone needs, uh, has an accident, if someone dies, um, in, in any, if anyone needs legal assistance. So in this case, let me just uh, commit that um, the Mexican consulate is a government office whose main mission is to protect the rights of Mexican and Mexican-American citizens. The consulate is basically divided in three areas. The Community Affairs Department, which is in charge of education, culture, health, and economic development, leadership training, and community empowerment. There's also the Documentation Department. That's what we're mostly known for. Uh, that's where we issue passports, birth certificates, consular IDs, and that's that certificates, because if a na Mexican national dies, once they receive their uh, U.S. death certificate, they must uh, process their Mexican death certificate. So we can also register that well, the person died. And obviously, many times people have properties or, or things that they might uh, have to do after someone dies in Mexico. And for that, 
to prove that they, they died, it's easier to do it with your Mexican uh, death certificate. In my department, the Department of Protection and Legal Affairs, we do a couple of things to assist Mexican nationals. One of the main things you know, that we do on a daily basis is to assist in legal matters, in legal issues. We have uh, 11 law firms hired here in the U.S. Um, where attorneys assist Mexican nationals and Mexican Americans uh, in any issue they might need assistance. For example, immigration, that's the, obviously one of them, the main uh, requests, or criminal law, civil law, family law, uh, labor law. Whatever issue they might need or have, we have attorneys available to assist them uh, for free. Of course, if they need the legal representation, they can hire the attorney for a, a more accessible fee. And in case the family does not have the funds to pay that attorney, the Mexican consulate can provide those funds, depending on the case and the economic situation of the family. So in this case, uh, what we try to do is not let small problems be become big problems because that's a common issue that we have. Since people are afraid to come to the consulate and sometimes, which we're trying to uh, assure them that the consulate is a safe place for every Mexican national. Uh, in, without, uh, uh, we don't care if you race, your background, religious beliefs, uh, your sexual orientation, your education, we don't care about that. As long as you're a Mexican national or Mexican American, we're there to help you. So uh, as I was saying, uh, it is important to, for people or, or Mexican nationals know that as soon as they have like a legal issue, they should come to us and let us, let us assist them through our attorneys. Because sometimes um, they let those small problems become bigger ones. They might have like a driving ticket, a traffic ticket, if they don't take care of it soon, as we all know, that might become a big issue and might even get like an arrest warrant in the future. So there's no sense of going, of letting that uh, small fine, $200 fine become like an arrest warrant or whatever that might also involve, involve regarding their family. Especially when uh, someone's uh, in a, an undocumented situation, um, that puts them like in the spotlight for ICE. And uh, in talking about ICE, one of the main uh, uh, functions that we do is, is contact ICE once a Mexican national has been detained. Because um, sometimes they're afraid of the process and they don't know what the process involves once they get arrest, arrested by ICE or detained. Sometimes they think that if they sign a, a waiver to be released as soon as possible, and be deported, that's the best thing for them. But on the contrary, if they have the opportunity to receive legal assistance, they can fight, according to the law, to stay here. And obviously, if they have family, it's better for them and their family to fight for their uh, stay here and fight that removal order if they might get it. So sometimes they are scared and they only are told, you know what, if you don't sign this, you're going to jail and who knows for how much time. And if you're not informed, well, you get scared and you say, you say well, you know, uh, I, better, uh, I prefer to sign uh, my deportation than uh, stay here who knows for how much time. So some, many of the situations that we find is that uh, in many cases, obviously people have an option to stay, a legal option to stay, to fight for their case. And obviously, they have the right to fight to stay with their families. And that's a big issue. As, uh, as they were saying before, uh, it is very important for us to keep the family together. That one's, that's one of our main focuses. And in this case, our ma major issue is the power of attorney letters that uh, people can uh, issue to family members or someone of their complete trust so they can take care of their children in case they are missing. And that's like part of the plan people should have in case they are detained and deported. Because um, if a person gets deported, then what's gonna happen with their kids, right? 
You, you want to make sure they're safe, someone's gonna take care of them. If they need paperwork, paperwork done in school, someone has the authority to do that. If they need medical attention, someone will have the authority to do that. And if it's your decision for your kids to follow you to Mexico, well, you need someone to do that uh, on a legal matter without any problems. Because obviously, when we're talking about taking a kid from one country to another country, it's not that simple as it sounds. And the best thing to do is to have this power attorney, which we help in the consulate, uh, uh, to issue them with um, the attorneys that we have and for free. And we not only not only help them fill out these forms, uh, this uh, power of attorney, but we also allow them to ask any type of question regarding the immigration status that they might have. So it's very important for them to go to a consulate and receive the proper, proper orientation. Because uh, as Latinos, as Mexicans, um, we're very confident usually about our neighbor, our brother, our compadre, who said, you know what, you can do this because I solved it this way, or my cousin solved it that way. But every case is different. Every situation is unique. And we need the advice of a specialist, an attorney specialized in immigration issues, or criminal, or penal, or labor law, whatever the issue is. So that's one of the main focuses that, that we handle. And in this case, we also promote what we call dual, dual citizenship. Since uh, 1998, the Mexican Constitution allowed people to have double citizenship. Uh, as you know, you might know Mexicans that have been, have been living here for many decades as residents, but they haven't applied for citizenship. That is because in Mexico before, we weren't, we weren't able to have dual, dual citizenship. And if you adopted another one, in theory, you would lose the Mexican one. And people would, know, would go, you know what? I don't want to betray my country. I love living in the US. This is a great nation. I live here. This is my community. But I don't want to lose that connection. But since March of 1998, uh, the law was modified, the law was changed, and now uh, Mexicans are allowed to have many other national citizenships. In this case, whoever obtains uh, citizenship apart from the Mexican is allowed to have it without any problems. So that's why we also promote that if you're living here, this is where you live, where your kids are born, where you work, and where you cooperate, where you pay your taxes, and you are part of the community. Well. Become a citizenship, a citizen, sorry. So your voice can be heard, right? So you can have full rights. And it's not a, a part of being half a Mexican and half a American. No, no, no. You're gonna be 100% American and 100% Mexican. And obviously, um, your kids also have the benefit of having the Mexican citizenship. It's very easy. It's, uh, and it has no cost. You can do it, the process, and basically it can be done in one day. You can go into the consulate. It takes a couple of hours, I have to be fair, <laughs> but it's done in one day. You can go to the consulate, take your paperwork, and by the end of the day, you'll have your Mexican birth certificate. It's $12. Well, it's for free. It's for free. The first uh, Mexican birth, birth certificate is for free. If you want another one, it's only $13 from there on. But even, even cheaper, you can even print your Mexican birth certificate online now. Just go to actas.mx.gov.mx, and there's um, a form you fill out with your your information, and you can print out your birth certificate at home. That fast, like that. And this is part of the process that the Mexican uh, government is trying to do to make sure that everyone has access to the documents. I was telling them. I understand, I understand that it is complicated to get your uh, American papers in order. And you, you might be in an undocumented situation, but don't be in a double undocumented situation. There's no reason for you to not have your Mexican birth certificate, your Mexican passport, your Mexican consular ID, including your Mexican voting card. It's for free, the voting card. And you can vote for president, uh, senator and some uh, governors in Mexico from here. They'll send you your voting card, and when the election comes, they'll also send you your package with uh, the ballots, which you send by email. Very easy. But it is important that people know that we have these services. 
and how, how, how useful they are. Because in any case that a Mexican national needs assistance, the first thing I need to prove is, prove to me that you are Mexican. As simple as that. Show me your birth certificate. Show me your passport. Show me your voting card, whatever. That's all I need to be able to provide legal assistance, funds, emergency assistance, whatever. It's as simple as that. But the situation is people don't have their IDs or their documents. That's a big issue. Or more surprisingly, even, um, there's cases where uh, people are brought as babies or were brought as babies uh, here to the US, but they were not registered in Mexico. So they're, they're, obviously they don't have documents from here, from the US, but they also don't have documents from Mexico. Unfortunately, uh, uh, for the last two years, uh, we are able in the consulate to register those people, people in that situation. Because I mean, basically they were like, having their human rights crushed. I mean, part of the human rights, uh, one of the basic human rights is the right to an identity. So they were in, in this challenge of not being able go, to go to Mexico and being registered, but obviously they couldn't do it here. So the, I mean, if you could think about a situation where someone's undocumented, would mention those folks, Let's mention those people, 20, 25 years old, and not being able to even have a birth certificate. So as I said, uh, fortunately for the last two years, we were able to do those reg registers. And uh, obviously that takes quite a time. We have to interview people, to see who their family is, their parents, if they have brothers, sisters, either here in Mexico, or even do ADN, um, DNA, sorry, that's in Spanish, DNA tests to prove that they are related to someone in New Mexico. And that's how we do that process to register them. So we have a bunch of services in the consulate that people usually don't know about. Uh, I know some folks think, it like, uh, like in the movies, it's just uh, a thing of having immunities or getting someone at the airport or, or um, I don't know, someone running away from an authority or or from some criminals and trying to get to a consulate, to a safe place, and trying to get them back to another country. I mean, th those issues can be possible, but the main focus that we do is assist people to have a better quality of life here. And when we, we say that uh, we assist people like in criminal uh, cases, we're not saying that we declare them innocent or they, that they should not have uh, uh, they should not be arrested. No, no. I mean, if you break the law, the law has to be applied. But what we make sure is that you are treated like anyone else. Everyone has rights, and that your rights should be respected. That's all. If you don't speak English and you're going to court, well, that you have a translator to assist you in that case. Because, I mean, it's law. It gives you, you have that right. It's just that. Um, one of the other issues that I wanted to mention is that, um, here, let me check out on my list, sorry. Another um, main focus that we're uh, working on now is DREAMers or DACA recipients. That's a big, uh, group of population that really needs our assistance because there are children, young people now, that have been here for many years that are striving to get ahead in life, that are very integrated in the community. Most of them are studying and have the ability to work, they pay their taxes, and obviously they feel this is their home. We understand them. They are Mexicans, or whatever part of the world they are, but this is their home. This is what they know. They grew up learning to eat burgers. They speak better English than 
than, he, than me or any other person that speaks English, uh, learn, learned English in Mexico. Yeah. So sometimes, and it's hard for them because sometimes they say, well, I can't identify myself like 100% Mexican because uh, I don't really know the culture, I haven't been there. But here, they, I'm not also accepted fully. So they are in a complicated situation. So right now, what we're doing is assisting them in renewing their DACA. When uh, there was a chance to apply for DACA for the first time, we also helped them through our, our attorneys or, or other agencies that we collaborate with. Um, but right now, we are focused on renewing them. And when we have the funds, that this is like a, a monthly basis, we also provide the funds for, for them to pay that fee, the $495 uh, uh, fee. Because in sometimes there's families that there's only not only one DACA, but then there might be two or three. And imagine having to pay $1,500. That's a lot of money. And as we all know, um, sometimes there's bad publicity in the media, but I mean, that's the minor, the minor amount of, of, of immigrants. Most of the immigrants in the US are here to work, to strive, to collaborate with the community, and make this their home. So while well, my time's really, really up, uh, I'll be here for questions. Please feel free to uh, come with me. And thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for, for all. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. That was wonderful. Lots and lots of information. Really appreciate it. So good to have an ally. Thanks. Um, our next speaker is Alejandra, or Ali. Uh, she's, um, she works in the Santa Barbara Unified School District and it works in um, outreach to youth in lots of different capacities and maybe she'll tell you about some of those. And um, she, her, her background in education is a bachelor's degree um, from UCSB and a master's uh, also in psychology from Antioch College. And there are many other added trainings that she's been doing in law and ethics and women's leadership. So she's got a great background. And she, mentioned to me that she fell in love with working it fell in love working with mental health agencies that were empowering vulnerable youth in, in the county and so she's followed up on that interest and is very deep into that experience and um, also her exposure to the hardships of youth in the foster care system um, were foundational to her looking for creative ways to educate and empower disenfranchised uh, communities. Right now, she works for the school district, as I said, as in it's a clinic, the position, I think I got this right, is clinical youth outreach worker and program director of the Wonder Woman workshop. I wanna go to that one. <laughs> Not a youth, though, maybe not. Um, she pro provides many um, supports in, in her um, working with um, at-risk adolescents and their families. She also has had leadership roles in other organizations, and one of the most fun ones to talk about is aviation. <laughs> so she said she stepped into the world of aviation as a volunteer with an organization called A Different Point of View, very clever, in 2014, and now she, in 2019, she's the executive director of that organization. And the whole goal of this group is to um, expose youth to flying and learning to be a pilot and that the opportunities available to them there. So that was pretty fun to learn that. So Ali, come and talk to us about what you've discovered working with youth in the schools.
you make my job sound so interesting and fun, <laughs> which is, it is. Um, I just want to say thank you, all of you, for being here. Well, and this is a lot of my job. Um, what I really do and I bring to the table is I am, in my world of psychology, that's really my passion and the foundation and my scope of practice. I have a master's in clinical psychology with an emphasis in Latino, um, Latino community. And, uh, but really what that really truly means is that I am all boots on the ground. I am at the front lines. I am interacting not only with students from K to 12, I'm also interacting with the service providers who are working with different capacities with our youth. I'm also interacting with the counselors, the teachers. I'm really hearing all sides and all angles of what is the issue, and it really comes down to one thing. The issue we're experiencing and escalating consistently is an issue of dignity, of how do we treat everyone with dignity. And it's seeping into um, our, the development of our youth. So I have a presentation that I'm going to. So as I said, um, I do a lot of case management um, at the high schools. I provide advocacy in the, commun in the community. I provide therapy, one-on-one -on -one therapy for our students. Um, I facilitate groups, and in the facilitation of our groups, it's about providing psychoeducation, empowerment, independent living skills. Um, I am doing this at the high schools, at the junior highs, and at a nonprofit called uh, the Police Activities League. Um, I am the program director of the Wonder Woman Workshop, which is designed intentionally to really empower youth to find their own formula for um, healing. How do you heal those wounds? And you are the captain of your ship. Uh, we do this through teaching them how to work out how to walk into a gym and not feel intimidated, walk into different scenarios, um, a self-defense class, journaling, meditation, lavender oil goes a long way. Um, <laughs> that's really why they come back. Um, the, I'm also the co-chair for the community engagement team here in Santa Barbara, which is a network of all the service providers who are really focused on the mission of reducing violence for youth. Um, and as you mentioned, a nonprofit for um, a different point of view, the executive director. And uh, I mean, just to literally look at our community from a different point of view, take a student up in the air and say, that's your school. That's the beach you hang out to. That's the zoo that you've been to. You belong. You're part of this. It is an honor to be able to do it and quite a privilege. Um, so the foundation and the terms that we want to really focus on throughout the presentation, as grim as they might sound, um, there is a highlight at the end, I promise. So first off, you know, to really describe the issue is birds born in a cage think flying is an illness. Um, you know, just the perception of a cage creates a huge attachment issue, and we're seeing this consistently. I have students who are been since junior high in their AVID classes, ready to step into college, afraid of going to college. That's an attachment issue. Um, what this is called is learned helplessness, a condition in which person suffers from a sense of powerlessness arising from traumatic event or a persistent failure to succeed. It is a thought to be one of the underlying causes of depression. Um, I'm gonna be talking a lot about the mental health issues that are rising in our community. The key to this in this definition is the senses. It's really engaging the mind, the body, the psychosomatic experience of threat. Um, our students are walking around with the consistent, the lid is flipped, the prefrontal cortex is shut down, and I am in consistent crisis mode all the time, from the morning I wake up to the end of the day. Um, they're in fight, flight, and freeze consistently uh, for the perceived threat of thoughts like, I won't have my mom. Kind of like Susan was expressing, you know, when other students see that their parents aren't getting picked up, that also translates to them. You know, um, I will miss my dad like Eric does. Eric is a student that um, his dad was deported, and he's an extraordinary, extraordinary student, wants to be an engineer. And when I spoke with him, he said, I'm fine, I'm fine, don't worry, I'm okay, I'm okay. But the eyes said something else. The body said something else to me. I know that. I saw it. Um, will I be in a cage soon? Is that going to be me? Uh, we are in a place where fear is just talked about consistently on the news, social media. Um, our youth have two worlds. They really don't know how to get away from the screen. 
you know, they have a world. While they're in class, there's a ding, 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 buzz, buzz, buzz. It's a whole world that's happening in, the, in their pocket. And they're very connected and very attuned to it. Um, so the common ground that we all have, and if you're here, here with us today, is that... Um, we want the same thing. We really want everybody to thrive. We have the common middle ground, um, as Maslow's hierarchy of needs really describes it really well. The foundation is psychological needs. Uh, we just want you know, w water, food, shelter, and to really be able to thrive and create your identity as who you are, your self-esteem, you have to cover each one independently and build upon it. Um, psychology psychological needs is first, the safety needs, uh, personal security, employment, resources, health, prosperity. And then we go on to love and belonging. My friendships, intimacy, family, a sense of connection. Do I belong? Am I part of this? Am I part of this community? And then the self-esteem. You know, do I feel respected? Can I give respect in return? Self-esteem, status, recognition, strength, and freedom. And then ultimately self-actualization. This is what we realize that each person in our community plays a really crucial role. And this is kind of the goal for a lot of us, but it's also a goal for our community. If we want sustainability, we want safety, we want our children to thrive, we're all interacting, we're all part of this, how are we going to do this together? Um, so I want to cover some of the narratives. My role today is to inform you not so much about statistics, um, unfortunately, because a lot of our students are still very hidden. All this information is not really reported, monitored. It's really hard to track what's going on. But the narrative part is what I have been experiencing, seeing. Um, like I said, boots on the ground. We're really down here with, um, with everything that's going on. So I just want you to know that, you know, there's a lot of crises happening, but our students are doing um, what I call family quake plans. Family quake plans is what happens, so when we have an earthquake, we have to plan. What happens? Where do we go? We know that our survival rate is going to be best um, if we plan accordingly and we have a plan. Um, now our students are really doing the family quake plan. For example, Natalie. Natalie is a uh, 12th grader, and a lot of the names that I'm using are actually changed for the protection and confidentiality of our students because they are here in our community. Um, Natalie is someone who is, um, she's trying really, really, really hard to make it, but every day she comes home wondering, is, are my parents going to be here? Um, how am I going to take care of my two siblings if they're gone? I am the oldest. I'm also not doing well in school. I don't feel adequate. I don't feel like I belong here. Um, and how, and my, my, my teachers want me to do really well in my classes, yet she's wondering consistently, where are my parents? If her parents don't communicate with her, which is really hard because they don't have cell phones, um, the cell phones are strictly for the students, for their kids, so that they can communicate. How are they communicating? Consistently wondering, where are they? Are we going to be okay? Especially in um, within the network of our community, there's a lot of uh, rumors. You know, it's like I saw a van here, I saw this car, I saw someone driving around consistently. What does that mean for us, right? Um, and so one of the barriers is not only my thought process, am I safe, is my family safe, then the next process, well, I also need to pay rent and I need to contribute because my parents aren't making enough to keep us living in this situation in this you know, one bedroom house. So she's working and because she's also undocumented, she is not able to find a job where she is also um, treated with respect and dignity. She is consistently harassed at her work. And as much as we try to sit down and try to work out a plan, there's barrier after barrier after barrier. This is only one of those few places that will accept her and give her a way to support her family, to stay in Santa Barbara, to make a difference and help her siblings focus on their education. Um, that is, uh, Natalie. Our students are also very vulnerable. That what I'm seeing is, uh, for example, Bella. Um, 
she came to from Mexico hoping that you know they could find better health care system for her dad who was suffering from um, I can't remember what it is but just a, like a back issue and she came with her dad from Mexico and her brother and they live in a home and I counted at least 10 people because sometimes I do home visits especially if they're not showing up to school and there's a lot of truancy issues and um, there's at least 10 people there and um, they the dad and she, even to just go to the bathroom, she has to have supervision. Her dad has to go with her or her brother has to go with her because they're not sure within the, whole, the four walls that they live in if she's going to be assaulted. They don't know those 10 people. They're living in one room, the three of them. And so she can't wear shorts. She can't wear makeup. Please don't draw. Please don't express. In fact, don't look like a girl. And then go, go to school and focus and try to learn English because if you learn English, that's how we're gonna get out of the situation. I have just so much pressure to just be, to survive. Um, that's an example. And she, when we started working, I, I had the honor of being able to work with her on one-on-one -on -one situation with her and provide therapy. And so we started working on these negative thoughts, but still even as a therapist, it's a little bit challenging to, how do we create safety with all this? Um, they can't live in another situation. They can't move right away. Um, also, the oppression of, you know, you're, you're a female. You are not safe. You are not allowed to talk to other people. The stigma of talking to a therapist of what's really happening is CWS going to be called. You know, are we going to be removed? Are you going to be taken away from us? We hear what's happening on the news, families being torn apart. Is that going to happen here? All because you spoke up. That's a really big challenge. And then there's the issue she presents, and she presents that she is suicidal. She doesn't want to live part of this. She doesn't feel like she belongs. She can't speak. She can't communicate with her teacher. She can't get her assignments. But she really wants to. And she loves pop music. She loves pop music. Um, it turns out she's a really great um, artist as well. And so when we find out, we do the assessment. And luckily, because we have resources in our school, uh, we were able to get her some support. And this story is actually to be continued. Um, our mental health crisis, as I mentioned with her, other students are coming out because of the crisis situation of suicide idea ideation. Um, for example, Alex. Alex was brought to me. I happened to be at the office really late, like around 4.30. And at school, that is really late. Everybody's gone by that time. And I'm working on some reports because I'm really behind my reports. And the Spanish teacher comes in, pops her head in, and she's like, can you please see Alex? And I said, absolutely. Steps in, and he sits. Hi, Alex. How can I help you? I'm not talking to you. No te voy a hablar. ¿Para qué? I'm like, okay, I understand. Here's some lavender and here's some Play-Doh, you know, do your thing. <laughs> and, and, then I'm, and, he, and then I say, well, just so you know, my name is Alejandra Belén Cortez Narvaez Melo Lopez, and I'm here to help you if you need anything. He takes a deep breath and lets me have it, really. He is from Honduras. He lives with family that, you know, he was trusted from his mom to his uncle. Turns out that he's basically treated like a slave at the house. He is expected to wake up at five in the morning, clean, um, get ready for, get everybody's breakfast ready. He doesn't even have a bed, no blankets, and he's suicidal. And he has trauma from when he immigrated to where he is today of all the trauma he experienced immigrating here. And he's a stellar student, and he's an amazing artist and a kind soul. And he's being, um, there's a predator around him that wants to treat him, that wants to, he sees the vulnerability of this child and wants to rescue him by taking him to his home and having him live with him, right? Um, so where do we begin? Where do we address? We get down to the safety, back to Maslow's hierarchy. We start off with a sleeping bag because if we also report he is also homeless. So these are the challenges that as teachers, as deans, the role is to the education, where do we go with all this, the narrative?
He actually ended up advocating for himself after I um, took him to Youth Interactive, a program for artists. And um, he advocated for himself to go to Florida to another family. And he has reported that he is a much happier there and he's actually able to draw and he has living a better lifestyle now. So there is hope and there's more of those stories to come as well. Okay. Um, the core is shaken. That's really what it comes down to. You, you shake the family system in this culture, there's gonna be a lot of repercussions to this. The emotional aspect, um, dysregulation, again, back to the fight, flight, or freeze, um, makes them more vulnerable. Education, you know, how are you really expected to focus on your education, the math problem ahead of you, if you can't go to class because your mom's missing? You can't go to school because your mom's in the hospital and you have to take care of the three other youth, your little ones. Um, the uh, vocation part, I can't get you a job. I'm sorry, you can't apply to that program. We need X, Y, and Z and you don't have it. And they know it. As I come into my groups of, uh, with my students and I bring in all these resources, I already know what students are not going to be able to qualify because they do this. Shame, guilt, not their fault. Um, then the, um, the social aspect, who can relate to this? Truly, if we're all hidden and we're not speaking about it, who will understand? I will be judged and therefore my shame and my embarrassment is going to skyrocket. Um, and so that's really where it comes to and, and this is why they stay hidden. They are a hidden community. Um, they're afraid to stand out, it's not encouraged and seeking services is actually really um, challenging. And that's something that a lot of surveys are showing through uh, behavioral wellness, county, probation. Uh, we did a youth assessments need here in Santa Barbara in Lompoc and also Santa Maria. And they realized it keeps showing the same thing that they're not accessing the resources. There are resources. Um, there is a lot of people who are willing to help and provide the right information, but it's the stigma. For example, my mom told me not to snitch, right? The snitching part. Um, you can't qualify. Um, I'm sorry, there's a wait list. And so there's just not an access of resources. Um, a historically underserved population and uh, more at risk. We have youth at risk, but these students are more at risk. Um, they are not assimilating. Because we're hidden, because we're not spoken, we're not wanting to stand up, that also means we're not broadening our culture in a good way. Um, the assimilation of, you know, this is who I am, and I'm also this. I'm also a good student. I'm also a good um, worker. I'm also, I'm also. And so, for example, Beatrice, I started working with her. She was brought to me after a student review board uh, meeting, she wasn't attending school. At the meeting, it turns out that she had been sexually assaulted by the men that were living in the home, again, kind of like the other student situation, and for who knows for how long, but it was barely brought up to her attention. I started with her, we started doing some trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy with her, um, and she was doing well. She started doing our Wonder Woman workshop, and things were doing really well, and all of a sudden, she disappears. And I'm wondering where. So I do a home visit, because I don't give up. Boots on the ground, let's go. I'm, I know where you live, I have the access to that, and um, I'm gonna go to your home, I'm gonna show up. I show up, and I'm from Mexico City, and in Mexico City, there's a pueblo called San Lorenzo, which I love, um, but it was like going back there in Santa Barbara. Even though the home looked neat, I walked in, there is dirt on the ground, there's no there's no ground, there's a hole, you can see the pipes. It smells really, 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 um, just, it, it's a really hard smell. And these are the living conditions that she's in. And I still couldn't find her, she wouldn't come out. I'm also not allowed to step into the house, but on the outside, it was almost like going back to my pueblo, right? Like where I was from. Well, that just shows also the lack of assimilation of not encouraging to step into a new environment, to step into a new lifestyle and to better yourself, you know, reach that full capacity. Um, it creates maladaptive attachments. Uh, students don't want to leave Santa Barbara. And when I mean Santa Barbara, I mean the West or the East side. Um, they don't, they wanna stay in these toxic relationships. They don't see above and beyond of what can happen for them in a positive way. Um, in the survey, they asked students, would you leave? If you had an opportunity to leave for a better life, would you leave? And they, I believe 85% said no. 
Um, and that increases youth violence as they're staying in their um, situation. Their gang activity has increased. There's a lot of uh, violence between women, domestic violence, assaults. There's a lot of assaults that are being um, not reported. And that creates a situation of complex trauma, exposure to traumatic events that disrupt many aspects of development and sense of self. I'm ashamed. I can't sleep. Why did I even? Why did she leave me? And the learned helplessness, which creates the foundation for adverse childhood experiences, and all the way up to early death. These are the. But here's the thing: if I I don't have the luxury to see the world as broken. Um, the world is actually, there's a lot of pieces, and in our community, these kind of events, the communication, the experts who are telling the information and not having misinformation, I um, have been able to say that empathy goes a long way, bringing this information to my youth. We talked about the census 2020, and they are excited, and they want to be part of it. So giving our youth a role, giving our youth the right information, they have a lot of accurate information, but they also have a lot of wrong information. Information. Thank you, social media. And uh, mentorship. If you're willing to mentor a student, you don't need any other information other than what's your name? What are you interested in? Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Talk about boots on the ground for our, our fourth speaker is Jacqueline Inda, and she's our community advocate. She's a founder of several nonprofits, including the Santa Barbara Response Network, which is co-sponsoring this community with, uh, forum with us. Um, the Santa Barbara Response Network is especially active in supporting local residents through traumatic experiences, such as domestic violence, immigration crises, and that includes the recent um, crises of our natural disasters, helping people through those things. And maybe Jackie will tell you more about that. But um, she was born in Santa Barbara, and she grew up as a foster child on the east side of town. And she became legally emancipated at the age of 17. Later, she went on to get her license to care for foster teens herself in our county. Um, her education has been in drug and alcohol counseling, business administration, paralegal studies, and legal mediation. Jackie's a, a social justice advocate, and she speaks on behalf of the most voiceless in our community, including, in the past, um, the fight against a gang injunction, um, leading the fight for voting rights with district elections in the city of Santa Barbara, and advocating for migrant rights. Most recently, Jackie's been instrumental in the opening of a new community center in the heart of the East Side. It's right across the street from the Franklin Elementary School on, on uh, East Mason Street. Welcome to the podium. Thank you so much for coming. Hello, everybody, and thank you for pushing through without a break. I know sometimes that's difficult, and it's been a long forum, so I appreciate your diligence in listening to all of the speakers. I also want to thank all of the colleagues up here, because you guys are amazing in all the work you do. Um, I really uh, want to share a little bit more about the local experience, how this translates down to local action, more than anything else. Because you've heard, I think we've all been touched by all the different stories that we've heard from what we see in social media, what we hear from our neighbors, and what we see out in the community every day. Uh, before I even start with that, I want to share a couple of things that I've seen in our neighborhoods and how this directly, all of the miscommunication, all of the fear, and all of that disbalance really does affect our kids, regardless of legal status. I think one of the scariest things for me is children that uh, don't have access to food. And in Santa Barbara, we do have a lot of different organizations that work together to feed our families. So why is it, or we ask ourselves, why is it that in Santa Barbara, there are families that refuse to access 
services like nutrition during the summertime for their children. Not even for them, but for their children. When the question was asked by the food bank to communities as to why that decrease had happened in churches and community centers, the message was clear. People are scared. And that's why we were starting to see a huge decrease of people accessing even lunch programs for kids in schools during the summertime. When you live in fear, no matter what they've told you of how wonderful things are, all the different ba you know, ballot issues, all of the different community organizations that are out there, none of that matters. When you live in pain, which is associated to fear, none of that matters. And just think about that. Think about what that means when you're a child and you see that lens. That here you were participating in the summer program last summer, and this summer, no, none of our family is going to go anywhere but stay home. I don't think I had ever been exposed, even growing up myself in the school districts, I had never been exposed to the question of, um, do I have papers? Do you have papers? When was that the common communication between children in our school district? And when did we let that be OK? But it is now. That a three, four, five-year-old or seven-year-old or a first grader or second grader or third grader has those conversations and dialogues with their teachers all the time. And imagine what it's like the kind of privilege you create and the divide in the community you start to build when the answer to these children from their parents and their family and the community is, oh, no, no, we don't have to worry about that. We have papers. That's their problem. And that is what happens here daily. That children come home with stories and that they're faced with the answer because we don't know how to answer with, no, 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 no. That's not us. That's them. When you create a us and them message, no matter what it is, it becomes fundamental in a divide in a community when that child grows up. I believe that the impact that we've been facing in these communities, in our community, in our neighborhoods, will impact not five years from now, but 20 years from now, in such a racial divide that it'll fragment our communities even more so. The repair that we will have to do as a nation will be felt palpably then. I mean, right now we're living in, OK, what happens with, or people are in fear. But just imagine the long-term effects of those small individuals that see it through that different lens and that start to feel the privilege of, no, no, that's not my problem. I'm safe. That's Santa Barbara. That's the city. That's each neighborhood. That's Carpinteria. That's Ventura. That's San Luis Obispo. That's Santa Maria in Guadalupe and in every single other place that right now those conversations are happening. So what do we do? I love the fact that organizations get together. Sometimes it's scary, though. And being an all honest Frank, in my opinion, the reason why it's scary is because a lot of the times you'll have organizations come together to pat their backs about the great work they're doing. And that's cool. I understand that because people are doing amazing work. But the issue in front of us is different than it has ever been. And if we don't become vulnerable as organizations, as leaders, to listen to what the new need is and what the new norm is, then we don't get anywhere other than hanging out in meetings and creating coalitions and looking at statistical reports and patting ourselves at the back for the work that we did similarly 10, 20, 30 years ago, with no change now. 
I know that people in the audience, people watching this, will start to question, well, what does that mean? What can I do? It's simple. What you can do is look at what you're doing now. There are things that we can do with associations. There are things that we can do with our own partner organizations, because we're all a part of something. We're humans, we all connect. Whether it's a church group, whether it's your parent group at school, whether it's the business you're running, every single person is connected to others. So just look at your own circle and ask yourselves, what can we do different now? Not who can we connect with that has been doing this forever, but what can we do in our circle now to take action? Because any action shows one thing. No matter what the action is, it shows one thing. It shows that as a community, there are people willing to stand up for other people to say, no, that's not OK. It's not us versus them. It's all of us or none of us. So think about the different groups that you participate in, whether it's the league, whether it is your church group, whether it's your um, arts and crafts group, whether it's your poetry group, whether it's your social activist group. How can you ask those questions? And the biggest question is, the, you know, the question to ask is, what can we do different now in this scenario to heal and to create connection? And if you think about the work you've done before, it's almost easy enough to translate it to now. You add more to it. And Santa Barbara Response Network, of course, we do psychological first aid. And the reason why we connect to immigration is simple. It's not because we're providing legal resources. It's because we're talking about trauma in our community and how that will impact our families and our neighborhoods in the future. We're not the only ones to have that conversation. And we know that the only way we're really going to impact a community is when everybody starts to ask that question to every single organization they're connected to. And then start to join action forums in whatever way possible to create change. I always tell myself the easiest way to know that you're not doing anything is to gauge how long you've been going to a meeting without any result. If all you're doing is going in there and meeting different people that are really cool and you get really cool networking, then you really haven't done anything. You've got to do things a little bit differently. And that means just being present. It means maybe stopping those meetings and actually being present in specific things. I mean, I'm grateful to have the consulate here, but imagine what it was like to a whole community, countywide, to hear that there were people coming into our borders and being stopped in encampments on the other side of the border and that all the different organizations in this community stepped up magically through the consulate to provide services to those people over there when nobody else could. It's just stepping up. It's being present. It was people going, OK, I'll buy big boxes of toilet paper, and we'll get it there. That tr trickles down to every single student, like, oh, you know what? These people actually care. Whether it's there, whether it's here, or anywhere, there's people who actually care. And it's not us versus them. And it's not them hiding deeper because no one cares about them. Those kinds of actions make a big difference. And we did open a community center under this new community church. It's actually a community church. It's kind of cool to be able to say that it's a community church without a name because there's all kinds of wonderful things that we can do under that aspect. And one of those things is bringing in different denominations to share in the space and to do things like, hey, OK, there's a food need. We'll open up a food pantry today. Not tomorrow, not a month from now, but today. 
Oh, community is worried about immigration in a specific area? All right, let's figure out a way to today make people understand what's going on and try to support them with their individual needs because really everybody has a story and their story might be different. It's not about being an expert, it's about being a handholder. That's all it really is. It's about being able to say, I'm here for you. I don't know what I'm doing either, but I'm gonna hold your hand through this to get you to these people that can help you. And even if it's I'm here with my sign and today we're all standing together, imagine what that does to the kids watching TV with their parents. And the conversation changes instead of us versus them to, oh yeah, that's right, that's how we do it in Santa Barbara. Imagine the pride change. So one of the umbrella programs under the Santa Barbara Response Network is the Immigration Advocacy Collaborative. And we have been meeting. Of course, we've changed different locations now that we sort of have a, a home under our community church. We're able to start to organize a little differently. Uh, but it is just bringing together resources so that we're not just sort of patting ourselves on the back, but getting organizations to think, okay, how do we address this now? And people will come in saying, you know what? I'm a business owner. I don't know what I'm doing. I just know I need to do something. And some people will come in and say, you know what? I hear there's a need. I know somebody who's got a refrigerator. Can you go pick up that freezer over there? Let's make this happen. What a beautiful community that we live in, that people do that. And what an awesome experience and message that is to everybody else in that area. So what I encourage you to do is think more about the spaces you live in. And ask the question without being scared of asking the question. Because I know asking the question means you get to do more work. Yay! Right? But if you ask the question, you start to get other people asking the same. And that leads to something more positive. And I know that we're talking about a long time trauma that we're going to have to heal and fix, right? Not only with immigration issues, also with women's rights issues, also with all kinds of other things. We have a lot of mending and bonding to do, and it'll be all of us doing it. But we start with taking steps forward to say we're going to do something different. Not we're going to do what we've been doing, but we're going to do something different from this point on. And putting aside all of the different barriers that have to do with not communicating with each other and loving the fact that we could sit on commissions for years without doing anything. It's putting those things aside to get action done. Because that's what our kids are seeing. Our kids aren't seeing the meetings and the commissions and the association um, hoopla that I like to call what happens in, in groups that try to cause action. It, it is what they see on television, what we see on social media, what organizations are out there doing, what people are out there they're doing, what business owners are out there doing, to create the message of, you know what? Mm -mm. We're all together in this. No matter what, you have a space and this is home. And there's a need, I'm helping. And I know Santa Barbara's always come together that way. I mean, we see that with the debris flow. We see that with the fires, with every single kind of emergency, like with the work that we did with the Coalition Against Gun Violence in IV. We come together. Imagine the healing power that we did in those marches and those vigils right after the mass shooting that we had in IV. That's huge healing in that community that continues to trickle on to this day. That's how powerful that was to the impact of those students. And yes, it's a different topic, but it's the same thing. It's taking action, not being the expert, not being that, oh, I'm not a part of that group, but just wanting to take action in your daily functions, in your own groups, and asking, what can we do now? So I appreciate all the panelists, and I'm going to cut it a little short so that you guys can get into questions and answers, but know that you can do something locally, 
And yes, you can always go to your different city councils. You can always ask for ordinances so that they can create declarations saying they support a specific community. That's social action, right? And those are big actions. In fact, locally in Goleta, that council has actually taken leaps and bounds, even to the point where they've sent um, letters from the council in Goleta saying, that's our resident. They belong to us. We want them back. Does it really do much? Maybe, maybe not. But it does enough to show that that council in that city is wrapping themselves around their community, all of the community, no matter what status. That's beautiful. Do we have that in other cities? Not really. Can we do that in Santa Barbara? I hope so. But it takes us all going there. It takes us all taking those steps. So just think about where you're at, what circles you're in, and use that to take action. And if you are a part of a civic engagement group, OK, ask your local councils, wherever they are. What are you doing to similarly do what other cities are doing in this region to make a clear stand for all community members, not just one pocket, but all community members in general? All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie, You're leading us in a good direction here. Um, I want to thank our terrific speakers for being here and their, for their preparation and their dedication to their work. It's just really clear what you're contributing to our communities, and we want to embrace that. So um, uh, if, do we have questions? We have um, a person with a mic on this side and a person with a mic on that side. So go ahead. So hello, um, and thanks to all the speakers. My name is Molly Kellogg. For those of you who are sitting here and want to take a direct, tangible step to provide assistance to our immigrant community, I am with an organization called Drivers Listos. We provide um, free rides for our immigrant neighbors who are afraid to drive um, because of the activities of ICE. Um, it was mentioned the situation at Harding School. We were involved in helping getting some of those children home. Oh, great. Thank uh, you. In addition to that, um, Jackie mentioned people weren't showing up. We discovered people weren't showing up for food distribution. They weren't showing up to Hispanic grocery stores. Oh, my God. Um, and it was because they were afraid to drive. So we've provided over 125 rides to our immigrant neighbors, including rides to immigration court in Los Angeles, to the ICE offices in Santa Maria and uh, Camarillo, where people have to register on a regular basis. So if you're interested, we provide training for all our volunteers. Two of our volunteers left the meeting early because they were giving rides to people today. So you can choose where you want to give rides within Santa Barbara, further afield. We really need always to expand our group of volunteers. So I have information. There's information at the back. It's called Drivers Listos. For those who don't speak Spanish, listos means ready. <laughs> Thank so, you, Molly. That's wonderful. I have a quick question uh, from Mr. Cerritos. Um, you mentioned that people could, who are undocumented could get birth certificates and, and so on. You also talked about dual citizenship. And so can someone who is undocumented get Mexican citizenship pa papers and then get U.S. citizenship? Dual citizenship um, usually refers when they already have uh, citizenship. U.S. U.S. citizenship. For example, if their parents are Mexicans, uh, but they were born here, they have obviously they have their U.S. citizenship, their birth certificate, but they are um, by law, by Mexican law, entitled to have the Mexican citizenship. And basically, all they need is to prove it with their birth certificate. And all they have to do is go to the Mexican consulate and register. In this way, 
they'll have all their, their rights, like any Mexican national, and they'll keep their rights here as uh, US citizens. Because sometimes people are afraid, if I become a Mexican citizen, will I lose some rights here in the US? Not at all. As I said, it's not uh, being, uh, talking about being half Mexican or half American. No, no, no. It's 100% US citizen and 100% Mexican. So basically for you, I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful because basically for people that have this opportunity, it's like the border doesn't exist. The two nations is their home. They're able to work here, to work there. They'll be able to work with transnational companies and they'll be at home, have property in Mexico, buy properties at the beach, at Cancun, Acapulco, wherever they want. <laughs> Can I add a little bit on that? Um, for example, I have, I have two daughters that were born here, but I'm, I was born in Mexico. So three months after they were born, I took them to the Mexican consulate with my birth certificate from Mexico, and they became um, Mexican citizens. So the, their Mexican passport will say nationality Mexican born in California. Same as our passport, for example, me from Mexico, nationality US citizen born in Mexico. So that's dual citizenship. So it's really good for, to have them if they have the opportunity. But to, be, to have citizenship, US citizenship, you will need to apply if you have a member, a family member who is a US citizen or a, or a US resident, they can petition for you and that's where immigration services can provide those benefits if you qualify to become a US citizen. So I can see someone who is undocumented, who doesn't have any papers, that if they, they would be afraid if they went to the Mexican consulate and went through that process and got their Mexican citizenship ID, that somehow that would get back to immigration services or something and they might be. Not at all, not at all. Um, we as a um, uh, part of the Mexican government, we're totally independent. We do not share our information with the U.S. government in this sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's I, totally safe. That's true. I have a follow-up question that occurred to me, Javier. When sure. you were talking about Mexican citizens, Mexicans, and Mexican Americans, I didn't understand what you meant by Mexican Americans. Did you mean a dual citizenship person? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. As uh, Blanca said, uh, a Mexican national that might have uh, come here to the U.S., become a U.S. citizen, I mean, that's it. If they become a U.S. citizen, they're still Mexicans. So we are still uh, abide by law to assist them. Thank you. Yeah. Like my daughters. They yeah, or, 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 or in this case, Good example. Uh, the example mm -hmm. of, of Blanca, her daughters, I mean, they have dual citizenship. They were born here, but they're also Mexicans, so we would provide assistance. Definitely. Thank you. Any other questions? One right here. Hello. Uh, I'd like to ask Alejandra to explain a little bit more about the resources that, like, Amazing uh, Woman. Yes, the Wonder Woman workshop. Wonder Woman. Um, that you can plug your uh, students into and how they find out about it if they're not coming in to see you personally, if they have other ways that encourage them to come in that they actually will feel confident to access? Yeah, thank, thank you. you, that's a great question. Um, to access these resources, it's really, really important that they you know, they are exposed to the information when web programs are available. I am very lucky to be part of the community engagement team here in Santa Barbara, which is the network of all the service providers. And we are always consistently setting out flyers. We're giving each other information. So for example, PAL knows the programs I'm doing. So there's a student that's at the Police Activities League or at Youth Interactive, which is a program that focuses on building entrepreneurial skills by creating shirts, doing jewelry. Um, it, we, for, I think our, our job as the service providers is to keep our counselors informed, so we're consistently connecting with them, the deans. Um, and I'm a point person at the uh, high schools currently that they can come and ask me information. I'm kind of the resource lady. I always have flyers just ready to hand out. And we need more of people like me who are just really ready to just profoundly send the message of the, these are programs for you. Um, and also they are... Um, 
just yeah, keeping our, our community informed with that. So a point person like me, the deans are always, uh, the deans, the counselors, the teachers, we're consistently sending information to them, but they also know who to contact. Currently with mental health, we have the family service agency therapist in um, junior high and all the way through 12th grade, and then cal calm counselors at the kindergarten through eighth grade. And they are always asking for my information. They're always getting consistent flyers, programs. They are great point people in the schools who have a lot of information of different resources, whether it's the, you know, what, where do, can I go get food? Where can I get mental health services? Where can I get a counselor, a mentor, a program to empower or a job? Um, they are really great people to contact for information. Thank you so much. And we're going to close now. And... Uh, just want to, again, thank everybody for coming and our terrific speakers and um, see you at the next forum. Good day. Thank you.